So. All right, let's get started with WonderCon 2012. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Ken Choi. We are missing some panelists, but hopefully they'll arrive before the panel's over or after the weekend. <laughs> um, one of my jobs is as a journalist, and I write for WideLantern.com. It's a website that focuses on entertainment and politics and pop culture from a diversity standpoint. So we invite you to take a look at our site. And one of our co-founders is actually absent. He's finding a partner. Um, his name is Adam Woolman. He's a executive, a uh, former executive for ABC. He's also a creative consultant. Um, ABC, if you didn't know, uh, all the networks have diversity programs. Um, ABC Disney is considered one, one of the best, um, as well as the most committed. And Frank Gonzalez, the director of ABC Disney Talent uh, and Diversity, is here today. As well as all the guilds also have diversity committees in some form or another. Here we have Brandon Easton, he's the creator of Shadow Law, as well as a writer on Thundercats, the new animated series. Um, next to him is Teresa Wong. She is absolutely perfect. Uh, Teresa Wong is a former writer on Night Rider, the remake, as well as she just sold her first pilot to CBS, so congratulations. Sir. <laughs> and you may recognize the last person on the panel, Randall Park, from his many commercials. He's also a writer, and he's the star, one of the stars of Super Ninjas on the globe. So the panel is on pitching diversity, and hopefully it'll be more of a conversation rather than a panel. Um, as a moderator, I tend to like conversation rather than five-minute speeches. So hopefully I, the guests will feel free to jump in and interrupt each other, and uh, hopefully the audience can participate as well. So let's begin with the executive. This is Adam Holman just rushing in. So the first question for the executives, are the studios and networks actually looking for diversity? Should I jump in? Absolutely. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank you for having us all here. And I'm so glad to be with all the other panelists. And I want to introduce also Curtis Chin, who I walked in with in back. He's the co-founder of Wide Lantern, which is devoted to trying to redress some of the imbalances in Hollywood and get more attention for artists of color and people who are underrepresented in television and film. Um, but the question is whether networks are actively looking for the person. Actually. Actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have to say, as someone who was on the inside as a network executive taking pitches and considering shows for development, um, yes and no. I mean, there's an extent to which people are now aware that the audience in America is very diverse and it's good to mirror that audience on camera and it's going to make for better entertainment. On the other hand, I don't think they do nearly enough to really reach out uh, and try to nurture and cultivate talent um, and to really try to make their, their slate of program development be as diverse as they could be. Um, now that said, I'll pass this on to my former colleague, Craig Gonzalez, who is actively working to counter that problem. So you may have a different opinion. Thanks, man. Yes, actually, we are never really looking for diversity. And you know, we have, for those who are familiar with uh, the things that we're doing over at Disney ABC, we have our, our Disney ABC writing partnership program, which has been gone for 22 years. And the unit has been there for a long time. That was pre ABC uh, Disney merger. Uh, but we got back to the bar, and we're working very closely with all of our partners within the company, um, our creative execs, our development execs, in terms of making sure that diverse voices are, um, are heard, and that we're making sure that we're very aware of when staffing shows and um, thinking about development, that that is a uh, primary factor in, in, as we move forward. Now, has it always been there? No, I've been actually working in the space for 12 years, and I've seen <coughs> organically grow and evolve into more of a priority. So, so I'm happy to say it has become more of a priority than it definitely is as for us. And is there a disconnect between actively looking for diversity and putting it on the air and producing? Uh, well, we, uh, 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 uh
Um, people can say, networks and studios can say that they're actively working, but whether it gets produced and on the air is a different matter. Right. Well, I, I think that's true. I think that there's a certain level of there's a process in place in terms of how things are developed and how things get into the development pipeline. And as we have effort to find more diverse writers who are in the system, and as they raise the higher levels, they get into positions where they can create content and can bring this to you as a network. So um, I think yes, I think there is a little bit of a disconnect. I think they're at a certain level when studios and networks are looking at deals with individuals and trying to bring folks in who can actually do shows. There's a certain level of experience, and we're still trying to get more folks into the pipeline to get that level of experience to be thought of as producing the bulk of the content. So I think there is a, a there is a disconnect. With that disconnect. Brandon, do you find that you're adjusting your creativity by the market to meet the market? Not, well, I'm mainly in the comic book field, and I just recently made a jump from graphic novels to animation writing, which is kind of a logical progression of the way. But I haven't really found that there's been people heavily interested in really diverse content, particularly when I show up. You know, because you can't, my name is very Anglo sounding, so when I show up, people are not expecting a six foot two black. So a lot of times, if you're good at reading body language, you can tell which people are uncomfortable with your presence and which ones aren't. And more often than not, you know, people tend to be, I mean, it's not like I've run into this wall of racism, because that's not the case, but I have encountered people who were somewhat surprised that I even exist, you know, as if all of us are street trash or something, you know. And I, I run into a lot of that, like the assumption that you just have more intelligence of, like, really, you do that? Like, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, for the comic book industry, I mean, my graphic novel, it doesn't really deal with race, it deals with more social politics and theocracy and things like that. But, um, and comics is a whole different ball game. But, I mean, as far as my general career right now, I mean, most of the folks I've met in animation have also made the leap from graphic novels into animation. So, like, specifically, boys action adventure animation, you know. So, um, those guys tend to be more comfortable with different, because you know, a lot of the storyboard artists and um, and are extremely, they're very, like Asians, like Asian, mm -hmm. Americans, like Latin, lots. I mean, you go to Warner Brothers or Hasbro or Sony Animation, you'll see what the, everybody's punched over the things. And all, you know, it's all kinds of folks there. So there's a comfort level. But when I have we tried to make a jump over to live action, it's a little bit more difficult because folks are just more comfortable working with people that they can relate to. And generally, your average writing staff is going to be up and class whites. And it's not a knock on it, it's just a reality. And nine times out of ten, people, whether they're not being overtly racist, are more comfortable being around people that they feel share the same values. So the assumption is I don't have those values. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing.